why? Why did she choose six for that uh, first number? Floyd? Because it was equal in which Yep, if we multiply the six P times P, we get six P squared. talking about factoring, and we're trying to figure out if we factor it correctly, multiplying the two parts together, distributing, tells us whether that's correct. It should come out to be the same. So why is 6 incorrect? Because when we multiply, right, when we multiply 6p times 1 and 1 times p, and we add those together, we don't get 5p. We do get 6p squared, and we do get 1 but we don't get five P's, okay? So, what would be correct then? Three P and two P? Okay, that'll give us six P squared, that'll give us three P plus two P, that'll be five P, and one times one is one. So why positive and negative four? Why would you choose those two? Right? I'm not sure. What's that? I'm not sure. Not sure? Thank you. Uh, positive four times negative four equals sixteen. Right? That's gonna be the same answer as before. If we multiply four by negative four, these two constants together, we should get the constant. It's the same. Ideas back here not exactly the same because we're not talking about the constant, but we multiply 6p times p, we get 6p squared. That's what needs to happen. Everything needs to come out to be the same when we multiply these together. Uh, so 4 times negative 4, negative 16. So that's good. That's success, right? But not completely. Why is it incorrect overall? Okay. Um, I was going to say, and the 4 and the negative 4 cancel out, so there's no atom in the middle. Oh, also that. We don't wind up with, a, with an n, right, to the first power. We get a 4n and a negative 4n, and we get nothing, right? There's lots of things multiplied to make 16. We could have done 2 and negative 8. We could have done uh, 8 and negative 2, 16 and negative 1, yeah. So that's a good point, too. Uh, that 4n minus 4n gives us 0n, which we should get. Right? So those are two good things. Well, ultimately, it comes out to be incorrect. Why is that? Why is that? Or Two ends being multiplied does not equal 49 and squared. So what do we need it to be? How should our factorization look? 7n. 7n. So it's a continuation of the pattern that we talked about last time. This is, uh, what's the special name for this pattern? Last time when we had a, a factorization that was a lot like that, it's a difference of this is a squared difference of two squares. The only way for there to not be a middle term, for there to be a to be able to write it like this. Nothing times n times 16. The only way we're going to get that is if these are both squares. Because we need to be able to get cancellation in that middle term. So if we're not getting the identical terms or the exact opposite terms, then we're not going to get that cancellation. 
So the difference of two squares, it can expand to the coefficient in front of n also being a square. The square root of 49 times the square root of n squared, which is just n, plus the square root of 16, and then the square root of 49 times n minus the square root of 16. So we have two perfect squares that factors as the square root of the first plus the square root of the second, the square root of the first minus the square root of the second. Um, solve the quadratic equation uh, correctly. So in the uh, circle, the blue circle there, what is that all about? What is that equation? Yeah. So we have that just taken by sigma n. Let's, uh, let's start by working backwards. So um, he's doing lots of things. Okay, so we'll start at the end, like why he's doing all that, what the, the end of all this work actually finds him. So when he's all done with this, what does he found? What does he pull out of all this work? This is done, whatever it was that he did, what was the information that he wound up getting and then like pulled into the rest of this problem? What was that that all that found for him? What's that? Is that it? I don't know. That's half of it. What's the other half? Three. The three, right? The negative ten and the three. That's it. The do you see that these two are equivalent? Is this, is this right here, is it the same as that? If so, how do you prove it? How would we know these are the same? What, did you guys do like a whole turkey for lunch? <laughs> the trip to Spain is getting to you? The negative 10 and the 3 equal the negative 1. Yeah, you add these two together, if you combine like terms, you get negative 7r. Okay. So they're the same. Now, if we had just known that just by inspiration somehow, you just it came to us in a vision that this should be negative 10r plus 3r, uh, we wouldn't have needed to do all that work. But negative 10 and 3 are very important. They're very specific. We could have split this up in an infinite number of ways as long as when we combine the like terms, we get negative 7r. All right. So this process is, is very important. Okay, so let's talk about that process. How does it go? How do you find negative 30? Where's negative 7 coming from? And why negative 10 and 3? Even if you even if you didn't even know anything about this, you could probably make some guesses as to where those numbers came from. You can see the numbers you have to work with here are numbers that you're seeing over here. And at least take a guess. If you don't remember how to do it, yeah? Does the 30 come from multiplying with 6 root 5? It does, six times negative five. So this is what I call the AC method just because it reminds me exactly what I'm supposed to do. Why, why AC, what's A and what's C? What's A? What does that mean? Six. Huh? Six. Six, yes, A is six, and what's C? Remember that 
a, a quadratic in standard form is ax squared, a is the number that you multiply by x squared, plus bx, b is always the number you multiply by x, plus c, c is always a constant, x by itself, has no x's. Okay? So a is 6, and uh, b, or sorry, c is negative 5, so when we do ac, or a times c, we get that number right there. And what about this, what is this guy? Where's that coming from? B, that is just B. We could just take these numbers, these specific numbers out, but this X and this AC and this B, same every time. You can get a rubber stamp and stamp it on every one of these factoring problems and it would be the same every time, okay? So we multiply six times negative five, that is negative 30. If you do nothing and you just guess, that would be a great guess. Negative seven, that comes from B. All right, so why negative 10 and three? Why, why not any other color? How do we come up with that? What criteria were we using? When we multiply these together, we get the same as A times C. We get negative 30. And when we add them together, we get negative 7. It's important that for them to add up to negative 7 because we're going to rewrite this, this negative 7, as negative 10r plus 3r. We're going to split it up into two like terms, and when we put them together, we get negative 7. So the reason why uh, we split this apart into two numbers is, um, is this, this next step. Okay? We're going to group them together, we're going to factor out a like factor, and we want these parentheses to wind up being exactly the same. Okay? Without getting too much into it and uh, you know, dragging on about it, uh, these two numbers, like I said, there's an infinite number of combinations that we can add two numbers together and get negative 7. But these two numbers, not only do they add up to negative 7, but they also are made up of, like the factors of these numbers are the factors of negative 30. Right? You'll find all the factors of negative 30 split up between negative 10 and 3. In fact, negative 30 could be, split, let's say 30, 30 could be split up into uh, 2 times 3 times, uh, let's, see, let's say 2 times 3 times 5. Yeah, 2 times 3 times 5. Fact, the prime factorization would be 2 times 3 times 5. So all the factors are 2, 3, and 5. Well, the 3 factor is there, the 2 and the 5 factors are there. We chose those numbers really specifically because here's what we want to have them. We want these guys to share factors, and we want these guys to share factors, right? But we guarantee that they're going to share factors because this number is the factors of 6 and 5 combined together into one number, right? So let's say that made sense, that's great. If it didn't quite make sense about all the factor talk and all that kind of stuff, here's where we go. We split the negative 7 into negative 10r plus 3r. Okay. Um, how do we get from here to here? That guy. How do we get from there to there? Or, well, reverse. How could we get from here to there? It's tricky. Take out whatever they have in common. Take out whatever they have in common. The, the, uh, very mathy definition of words you need to do is you factor out any common monomials. Okay? Or another way to say it is well, undistributed. I like that. A lot of people like undistributed. That term makes sense. If we distribute this 2r into the 3r minus 5, we'll get 2r times 3r is 6r squared. 2r times negative 5 is negative 10r. So if we can distribute, we can undistribute or factor out. And figure out how it would factor, what the stage before factor or uh, distribution would look like. So that if we were to distribute this common monomial, this common uh, factor, back into the parentheses, we're back here again. Okay, undistributed. How does that? Is that undistributing idea? Does that make sense? For one person so far. If it doesn't make sense. Say anything whatsoever. Doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. It doesn't. Okay. Uh, here we're gonna. I'm gonna 
to rewrite just this part right here, 2R. 2R times 3R times R. Can we distribute this 2R into the parentheses? So going from here to there is just doing the distribution in reverse. We figure out what could be distributed uh, throughout what two terms to get this. What did, do th what did these two things have in common? What do 6 and 10 have in common? A 2, right? Not a 3 or a 4 or anything else. Just 2 is the biggest factor that they have in common. And they also have an R factor in common. Is right here, this is 1 times r, this is r times r. So if we go back a step, before we, get, before we distributed something into these parentheses, that's all this step is about. Okay? So it takes looking at the coefficients saying, what do they have in common? The biggest factor that they have in common. In this case, it's 2. Also for the, the variables, do they have a variable factor in common? In this case, they do. We take that out, we undistribute it, and then we rewrite it so that when we, when we do distribute it, or if we were to distribute it, we get the same thing. So that's what, from here to there, that's what that was about. Okay. We do it again for the other group of two. In this case, they had a factor of 2r in common. But in this case, they don't have anything in common. The biggest factor they have in common is what? One, right? They're only, both of them are only both divisible by one. So we can factor out a one or undistribute a one, which is kind of a silly when you think about it. Factoring out something when you multiply, when you distribute something, it's even different because it helps us with the next step. So undistribute that one, which doesn't look a whole lot different. And the key to all this that what we wound up with are identical parentheses. Identical parentheses. Uh, <coughs> if we just want to get through with this problem, we just use this pattern. Right? The pattern would be, look, the, the parentheses that are identical go in this set of parentheses. Parentheses or the uh, what's left makes up the other parentheses. Okay. You can always write the next step, the next step after this, correctly. If you take the identical parentheses, right? You see that that they are the same. That's important. And you write that parentheses, and the other one is made up of this plus this or minus this little thing. Okay. I don't. I'm not personally satisfied with that answer. So let's take a look at what's going on there. Um, if we go back to this step, how do we get from here to there? Undistribute. Okay? We undistribute. And here we undistribute, undistribute the one. Okay? So this, these two had a common factor, right? We factor it out. Well, now we have one term, two terms. Just like here, we had one term, two terms. There's two terms right here, and they have a common factor that we're going to undistribute. What is that common factor that we're going to that these both have in common. One, the de definitely two things always share the factor of one. Okay, so remember what a factor is. What is a factor? Is three a factor of 15? Just for example, is three a factor of 15? Yes. Why? Like, prove it to me that three is a factor of 15. Three times five. The, the very specific definition is three times five is fifteen. To say it goes into kind of is the same to say it, that it, uh, it's a factor. But if we say three times five is fifteen, there's your proof. Okay. So when we're looking for factors, we're looking for things that are multiplied by other things. So if you look here, this guy right here is multiplied by two r. This guy right here is multiplied by one. So this is a factor. What I've underlined in red. And all 
also it's a factor over here as well. It's a common factor among those two terms, this one and this second one right here. There's your common factor. You've, you've undistributed this factor of 3r minus 5 right, outside the parentheses, outside these parentheses. Just like you factor out a 2r from these two. This had a factor of 2r, this had a factor of 2r. We undistributed. This is a factor of 3r minus 5. This has a factor of 3r minus 5. We've undistributed it. Okay, so I just circle it. So as to emphasize what I'm about to do is I'm, I'm going to leave the parentheses like intact altogether. And then distribute it to 2r first. Okay. Without multiplying it all out like we usually do. Um, if we distribute this whole parentheses to 2, or 2r, that's what we get, 2r times that parentheses. And then if we finish distributing, distribute it to the 1, we get 1 times 3r minus 5. So we can distribute this whole, this, this parentheses as one big chunk to 2r and to 1, and this is what we would get. If we go the other way, we just distributed that parentheses of 3r minus 5. <coughs> and I, I know from the experience of being taught this that it's really a wheel. Somehow, this isn't too hard, right? There's a two R in both of those, and I had to distribute that. But I'm distributing an entire set of parentheses from two terms, it is somehow hard to grasp. Okay. It just takes a few times of, of doing it, looking at it, maybe doing this yourself, distributing this set of parentheses to both of these terms and seeing. Distributing this into these parentheses and getting this, just like I would distribute the 2r over here, and get this, and distribute the 1 over here and get this. Okay. So, uh, if you want help understanding that later on, if you look at it again, uh, I'll be happy. Okay, so on to the second one here. Seeing as Emmett did find, he did find the uh, correct factorization, that is correct. Why has he not correctly solved the equation? Take a few seconds there, write, write something down. Why is that? Why hasn't he, he did factor correctly? Why isn't he finding the right solution? Say again. Um, split them apart and then subtract one and then add five. So make two different equations. What do these equations look like? So you're gonna subtract five equals zero. Yeah. Or two r plus one equals zero. Perfect. And then you said subtract one and add five, like solving them kind of at the same time. Okay. Two r equals negative one and three r equals five. Divide, yeah. Like those last two steps that we've talked about several times. Divide by three, so r is five thirds. That is a solution to this equation. And r equals negative one half. That's a solution to this equation. And stuff like this, this is what I always idea that there's there's some number for r that when I square it, multiply by 6, and then subtract that same number times 7, and then subtract 5, I get 0. It seems impossible to find with like the, the knowledge, the information that I had prior to that. And then the idea of factoring it, making it a product, then being able to say that one of those has to be equal to 0, and solving those two easier equations, and find these these really wonky answers, 5 thirds and negative 1 half. The, the process itself, each step along the way, wasn't that difficult. Using some pretty basic ideas and 
and just kind of one step at a time, getting closer and closer and closer and figuring out these few really strange answers, these really strange numbers or solutions to that equation. Yeah. One last one. So Clara does this correctly. Why did Clara add 5x squared and subtract 22 from both sides? You see that right here. Why is that important to have done? Why is that important? Why did she do that? Anybody have any ideas why she would do that? Why you should do that if you see uh, an equation like this you're supposed to solve? This equation sort of starts out this way. Uh, how is it different from this equation? How this equation starts out? Yeah. This is equal to zero, but this one starts off not equal to zero. And you can see the next in the next step, if the even if this wasn't the right answer, or whatever we observe at least we notice that it is equal to zero. Is that important? Is it important for that equation to be equal to zero? Why is it important? Why should it be equal to zero and not anything else? this at length in the last class too. Why is it important that we have this equal to zero? Not equal to 18, and not equal to negative five x squared plus 22, but have it be zero on that side. Back to uh, this one from the, from the previous quiz, from the previous section. You got it. And we talked about setting this equal to 80, setting that equal to 80. Why does that not work? Why can you not set each of those equal to 80? Why is it important that that was equal to zero? There, you're saying that there is a guarantee that r plus 10 equals 0? Is that what you're saying? Uh, That's probably a pretty smart thing to say. Are you saying that? If you were to say that, yeah. how could you justify that? How could you justify that there's a guarantee that this must be equal to 0, let's say, or, and this should be equal to 0? How is there a guarantee? That it equals 80? No, no, not 80, that this equals 0 or that this equals zero. How can you guarantee that? Um, you put negative 10 plus 10 equals zero. We 
you're telling me how to make this equal to zero, but how can you guarantee that it must be equal, that this or this would have to be zero, that one of them had to be zero. That's the only way they can meet. That's not true of 80, right? There's lots of other possibilities. Why would this have to be zero or this be zero? What is the guarantee, Emily? Because if the answer is zero and you're multiplying, at least one of the answers has to be zero. Yes, so if we're multiplying two things together, which is what we plan to do when we, when we approach these, these quadratic equations, we plan to make it multiply two things together. That's what we call factoring. Right? Factoring three times five is 15. That's why three and five are factors of 15, because they're multiplied together and make 15. This thing times this thing is this thing right here. They're the factors. These two are the factors, because they're multiplied together of this thing. So we plan to factor them together, or fa factor them, I guess, apart, if you can see it that way, uh, and set that product, that times thing, multiplication, equal to zero. And if your answer is zero, and you're multiplying, as Emily said, then one of the things you're multiplying by must have been zero. So, come back here. Why is it important that you add 5x squared and subtract 22? So that it's equal to zero? Why is it important that it's equal to zero? What are we planning on doing? There is a commonality among problems in 4.3 to problems in 4.4, we approach them in exactly the same way, which we're brought about here. What is it that we're doing in 4.3 and 4.4? It's the same for every equation that we're solving. step from here to there, from there to there. It's a big, important, we're making a leap here, right? We are taking this equation and saying that these two things have to be true. This is like, we're not really solving anything here. We are, we're making an implication that given that this is true, then these two things, one of these two things has to be true. So if we come over to here, do we make a similar implication at some point in this equation? Mm -hmm. Where do we say where do we do that same thing? You're saying yeah we do? Yeah. Where are we doing that? 3x plus eleven equals zero and 2x minus two equals zero. Uh this is right here? Yeah. What did it say? Yeah, from here to there we're making the exact same implication. We're saying if you're getting zero, it was just using Emily's words here, if you get zero for your answer and you multiply, then one of those things had to be zero. Right? The reason why we're doing that is to set up this step right here. If it's not equal to zero, if you get down here and you're multi you're, you factored it beautifully and it all works and it multiplies out to make this thing, or it multiplies and multiplies it to make this original thing, but it's not equal to zero, then now you've got a problem. Because you can't just say, whatever this number is, one of those has to be equal to that, and one of these has to be equal to that. That was the problem in 80. We saw that last class. You can't just set it to whatever, whatever's there, it's got to be zero. So that when we move from here to there, that's true. One of those has to be zero to multiply to make zero. And if we're gonna multiply to make zero, one of the sides has to be zero. So in order to make one of the sides zero, we need to eliminate everything else, and so it's zero. Not one, and not 80, but zero. So we negate the 5x squared, or the negative 5x squared, we negate the 22, and now we have zero on this side, okay? Uh, so, we'll say so, that, 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 and some, and e, and factor, and set each factor, Factor at some point, that's our plan. We're going to factor this quadratic, and then we're going to have it set equal to zero, and then set each of the factors equal to zero at this stage. Okay. Now, rather than walk you through this again completely, we just do the AC method here, like we talked about before. We take 
A times C, 18 times negative 22. And here's B. We have the two numbers that multiply together to make negative 396 and add to make 21. Does it take too long? It takes a little bit of time, but it's not too much time. 33 and negative 12, so we rewrite 21 as 33x minus 12x. And in this next stage, we group these together, factor out a 3, right? 18 and 33 share a 3, factor out an x. So we're going to undistribute a 3 and undistribute an x. Undistribute a negative 2, or factor out a negative 2 here. And we see parentheses are identical, meaning that this has a factor of 6x plus 1. This has a factor of 6x plus 1, and we undistribute that factor of 6x, or sorry, 11, 6x plus 11. And that's the trick, right? And so since a product is equal to a zero, then one of those things will be multiplied by must have been zero, and it's just positive, so it's going to Now, that was the AC method. That's what Circleman read. But rather than doing that, rather than doing what Circleman read, could Clara have done it different? Can you do it differently? Oh. Oh. Respond to that in your notes. Say whether or not you can do that. whether or not you can, other than you can, can I do that? And whether or not you know. What is another way we can try and do the factorization? Can you say other than just negative or other than? What do you mean by guess and check? Like, what, what does guess and um, check even look like for that factorization? Splitting up what we can. Splitting it up how? Being where it multiplies yeah. to 18 uh, right. by 6 anyway. It's negative 22. We need to do the rest. Um, for the guessing and checking, here's the thing. We, we, we start here. We start here, and then we do all this work, right? Do all this work. That's what we were trying to do the whole time. That's why we did all this stuff in red, or circled in red. Well, we could just try and, and go from here straight to there. But the only things we know are that the, the two numbers in front of the x's need to multiply to 18, and the two numbers that uh, multiply without x's need to multiply to make negative 22. But until we actually multiply this out, distribute this stuff into there, we won't know if it adds up to 21 or not, so then we'll have, that's the checking part, right? So the guessing part is the, the factors of 18, splitting up all the factors of 18. So uh, that could look like 6x and 3x, uh, or it could look like uh, 18x and uh, 1x, or that could look like 9 So those are the three ways we can factor 18. And then in each of those, we would have to try out all the ways that negative 22 can factor, which would, uh, we're lucky that it just factors 1 and 22, or 2 and 11. But it's a negative 22, so it should be negative 2 and positive 11, or positive 2 and negative 11. And for that matter, it could be 11 here and negative 2 there, or negative 11 here and positive 2 there. And then the same thing going up here too, and it just becomes only two ways to factor 22, and all of a sudden, since it's negative, we come up with four for this, we'll come up with four for this one, that'll be eight each. If none of those works, we have to try this, we have to try those same uh, possibilities here, that's eight more. Try it again over here, that's eight more. We could possibly be trying 24 different combinations before we find the right one by checking it. Guessing and checking. Okay, so just plan the numbers here, 
doing this is going to be a lot less uh, time than all of this stuff. Okay. Um, are there any other questions for the homework? That's a rule. Yeah, because it shows like times long, like here it's supposed to flip in, like up here. It flips down. Uh, I guess it's just a coincidence because we could write x plus four first and three x minus two second because whatever four you multiply it doesn't matter. Right? And then the negative would be first and then So I would say I wouldn't go I wouldn't venture too far down that road looking for a pattern there because yeah. it's uh, it, it's not going to be predictable enough. Um, if if that last number is negative, then one of, one of the numbers is going to be positive and the other is going to be negative because they have to multiply together those two constants to get the constant number. Yeah. So one of them will always be positive. Figuring out which is which. So we have to just decide what we're. If you're going to guess and check, deciding means you know, deciding on some combination and just saying I'm going to try these ones. That's all they're showing you on that first page. Is just find all the combinations of factors, factors for five and factors for six. Right, in the first example, in the second example, factors for three and factors for negative seven. In the second example. And then pair them up every which way is possible until one of them works. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that that's the guessing and checking method. Um, but once the first number factors several different ways, and the second number factors several different ways, you've got a lot of guessing and checking to do. Uh, if we were to set up the the chart uh, for this previous one way that they have it, it would, what's up, we got a seat, what's the one, so it would look like this, okay, in this first one we'd say, let's say, six and three, so a factor of six and three, okay, and with that we could do, uh, one, say one times negative 22. One and negative 22. Okay, that's a possibility. And then we would write the factors like this. 6x uh, plus 1 times x minus 22. And we multiply those together. And we would see, does that multiply together to make the thing that we're wanting to make? Does that multiply together to make... Uh, 18x squared plus 21x minus 22. Does it multiply to make that? Um, let's see then. What we've done already. That turns out no, it wouldn't do that. So, oh sorry, this would say 2x. 2x. So that didn't work. So we'll try 6 and 3 and negative 1 and positive 22. And we'll do that and we'll see if it works out. And then we'll do it again and see if it works out. Do it again and see if it works out. Until one of them works out. Which is a lot of different. 
Any other questions? talk about solving square roots, which means we should know how to use square roots and simplify square roots. <coughs> you should be very familiar with square roots. Like seven brings the square So what's the square root of a number? Let's start with 16. Let's just start. Four. Why? Four times four is 16. Okay, so it equals four because the very definition of the word time of four is 16. Is that Number times it's itself identically, not with anything different, right? If it's positive, multiply it by the positive version of itself. If you say it's negative, multiply it negative times a negative. Okay? So that's what it's all about. The square root of a number is a number that we can multiply it by itself to get the original. Okay. Wait, wait, so yes. So when you have one negative four also be the square root of sixteen? Uh Yes, we could we could say that negative four also is the square root of sixteen. Okay. So when someone says what's the square root of sixteen, they're wrong because it sounds stupid because they're two square roots. It sounds stupid. Probably the average person, well, you know, the average person doesn't remember what square roots were. So maybe not stupid. So we're above average people. Uh, I think that you are currently learning things. The average person. So the first thing we want to do is show uh, that we can how we can take square roots and combine them together. Okay. Uh, so for the square root of uh, of a number times the square root of another number, what's the square root of the product of those two numbers? Four. It's not inconsistent. The square root of a number times the square root of another number is the square root of their product. So. The square root of uh, 3 times the square root of 27, well, that should be the square root of 3 times 27, and that's 3 times 27. Okay. What does that give me? 81. 81. 70. Well, hey, does, hey, does 81 have a square root? What is it? Now, pay close attention, especially you, Gordon. Okay. Uh, if you start off a problem, and it's, it just says, like, simplify this. We're going to assume that this answer will be positive. Okay. We'll, we'll only go with negative if they give us a negative. They say, I want the negative. They'll put a negative. So if it just says simplify, we'll we'll keep the sign from the from the outside and apply it to our final most simplified version. Okay. Then we'll talk about when we come up with the positive and the negative. But for right now, let's just kind of assume that they're telling us what they want. They want the positive answer because they didn't say negative. They don't want the negative. If they wanted the negative one. If they wanted the answer to come out negative, they could have put a negative right here, and then they've got. A would have gotten a negative number. Okay? Let's just kind of play it that way. Just 
hopefully to avoid some confusion. There will be times when we want the positive and the negative, but I'll explain the difference. So it starts off, it should, the problem starts off with the square root. Let's assume they know what they want. They want the positive. If they wanted the negative, they would have put the negative. So multiply two square roots together. You can put one square root of the whole thing, multiply the numbers together. Similar with division. Square root of A divided by the square root of B is equal to the square root of the fraction A over B. And you can go the other way too. If you have a square root of fraction, you can take the square root of the numerator over the square root of the denominator. <coughs> So let's say we want to simplify this is number 4 and 4.5 to the square root of 192. Simplify would mean that if at all possible, we'd like to find numbers that have perfect square roots and find the square root. Right? And if it's possible, then, then none of those numbers will be factors of 192. What we're going to do is we're going to square, or we're going to factor 192, right? one number times another so that we have one of those numbers be a perfect square. So now we can take and separate those into two different square roots and simplify. So what I'm asking you to do now is find a factor of 192 that has a square root, a perfect square root. Find one. It doesn't take too long. There's not that many square numbers just that go into 192. First we could try, what's the first square number? Four, okay, that's actually one. The four would be the second one, right? And the only one that was really finding that one goes into 192 would really matter. So does four go into 192? Yeah, okay, probably four times what? This property of square roots, like either this way or that way, we can break this up into two square roots times each other. So, the square root of four times forty-eight becomes the square root of four times the square root of forty-eight. And what's the square root of four? Two. So we got two times the square root of forty-eight. But. goes into 48, so it's 2 times the square root of 16 times what? 4? 4? 3. 3. Okay. So we break this apart into 2 square roots. 2 times the square root of 16 times the square root of 3. What's the square root of 16? 4. Times 4. That's 8 times the square root of 3. Factor 192 so that there, we have to find a bigger perfect square that goes into 192. Right? Maybe we don't stop at 4, maybe we go up to, well, 16 would work. What about something bigger than that? The biggest square number that goes into 192. Square number. Um, What's it? 96. 96? Not 96. It would be 96 plus 96. Right? 96 times 2. That's 
192. Okay, now let's read. Number 192. Is that divisible by any larger square number? It was definitely divisible by 4 and by 16. If it's divisible by 4 and 16, would it be divisible by 4 times 16? Probably. Yeah. 4 times 16 is 64. Is it divisible by 64? Yeah. You shouldn't be surprised. Okay. What was our answer the first time? 8. What's 8 is the square root of? 64. 64. All right, 64 times 3 gives us 192. So if we didn't want to go through that many steps, we could try and find a bigger square number that goes into 192. Like the square root of 64 times the square root of 3. 8 is the square root of 64. Either way, we're going to come down to the same answer no matter what. Oh, you better come out with the exact same thing, right? If it's the most simplified, then we pull out as many square numbers as possible as factors, and that will definitely get us to 8 root 3. And when you come out to 8 root 3, either you're not done, because there's more simplifying you could do. Like, here's an example of somebody who simplified it, but not all the way. Uh, either you're not done, or you did something wrong. Either way, you should come out with the same. This idea right here is uh, it's really the beginning of making the quadratic formula. Remember the quadratic formula? It's A equals A to the negative square. Okay. Um, but using square roots to solve quadratic equations is key. Okay. So we'll start off real simple. So simple. Say anything, or well, you can think whatever you want right now. But 13. Shh. Uh, we can think whatever we want, and we can find that the answer is 13, but I want you to think about inverse operations. Okay? If we had s plus 2 equals 169, we would isolate s by doing the inverse of addition by 2, which would be subtraction by 2. s would equal 167. If we had 5s equals, let's just use 25 so we think about nicely. Well, we got 5 times s is 25, so we do the inverse of multiplication by 5 plus division by 5. S equals 5. Um, let's see, if we had s, s divided by 12 equals 2. Well, s divided by 12 is 2, we do the inverse. Uh, division by 12, that's multiplication by 12 is the inverse. Multiply by 12, we get s is 24. Just like we're trying to get the opposite, the inverse operation of whatever's being done. Here the inverse was subtraction, here it was division, here it was multiplication. Here we're taking s and we're multiplying it by itself. What's the inverse of that? The square root. So squaring something is finding the square root of that. So we take the square root of both sides. Let's make sure that that makes sense and that that all works out. What's the square root of s squared? S. Why? Because s times s is s squared. That's why. S times s is s squared. Why, why is 4 the square root of 16? Because 4 times 4 is 16. Why is the square root of s squared s? Because s times s is s squared. Now, what's the square root of 169? 41. 13. Plus or minus 13. And let me try to explain the difference to you why it's plus or minus now and it wasn't before. It's because the original equation is, wants to be solved. What does it mean to find the solution to an equation? Makes the equation true. What makes the equation true? The answer, the answer, the solution would be some number, right? Some number that when you plug it, it makes the equation true. When we started this equation, 
It was just that number times itself equals 169. They weren't very specific, right? They were just saying S, some number S, any number S, that multiplies by itself and gives you 169. So that's kind of a mystery. Before, when we were just simplifying, it wasn't as mysterious. It was, if they wanted a negative number, they would have said so. Does that make sense? They were, they were being specific. They're saying that the number should come out positive, so they come out with a positive 8 root 3. Here, they're not being specific. They're not telling us what kind of number they would just want a number that when you multiply by itself, you get 169. A 13 or negative 13 to satisfy that original equation. Either one of them. <coughs> so when, when we take the square root, like we come up with the idea of taking the square root, then we have to allow for a positive or a negative because either one of those is going to solve or uh, satisfy the equation, make the equation true. Okay. So the inverse of the square is the square root. You want to think of it as squares and square roots cancel each other out. Twenty-six. I want you to think about using the, the square root here. And uh, a little work on that to be ready to get on that. said, I want you to think about using the square root. The new idea is using the square root to, quote, cancel out the square. We understand this to be inverse roots now. All right, but this doesn't look as straightforward as number 22 did. You just take the square root of s squared, the square root of s squared, and add to the s, because that's how you add to the s squared. Okay, this is different. So something about this problem is going to have to be different. I have to think about it differently, or maybe do something uh, first before we do the square root. Or divide four by both sides. Okay, divide on, divide four on both sides to cancel out that four. Now we get p squared equals. I think it was one fourteen. Is that right? Okay. And now it looks like the previous problem looks like number twenty-two, where we just took the square root of both. How does everybody feel about that? What's that? 112. 112? Right? That makes sense? Get the, get the square thing by itself and then take the square root. Okay. Not the only option, but we'll, we'll stick with it for a second. Well, at this stage, what would you do? Square root of both sides. Take the square root of both sides. Square root of t squared is p. Square root of 112, well, the number that multiplies by itself to make 112. Well, let's see. 121 has a square root, 100 has a square root, square root of 100 is 10, square root of 121 is 11. Uh, but 112 does not have a perfect square root. So, well, it's either a either positive or negative version of this number will work, will multiply to make 112. So far, we're just calling it the square root of 112. But maybe we can simplify it. Right, let's put it into two factors that, so that one of them is a perfect square. If so, what number goes into 112? 10 multiplied by 83 is 0, so it has to No, that makes that one right. And that's people. We simplify this square root just like we simplified this square root before. What's that? Two times sixty-five. Two times sixty-five. Two times fifty-six. Two times fifty-six. Okay, it is divisible by two and by fifty-six. The thing is, though, here's what we're going to do: two times fifty-six. We're going to do plus or minus two times 50, square root fifty-six. Now, does either one of these become simpler? Mm. Why not? Neither one of them is perfect squares. If one of them were, it would become simpler, but neither one of them is a perfect square. 
So we'll back it up. And we'll make sure that when we factor it, when the missing limit square. We all look at it. There it is. Okay. Now, let's factor this so that one of them is a perfect square. And so that when we write it as two different square roots, then it actually simplifies. So check four. And four will work, but maybe nine will work. Or maybe 16 will work for a bigger square number. Biggest one we found so far? 16 times 7. 16 times 7? That's good. Well, that's got to be the best one, right? Because it's 7 going to factor. 7 times 7. 7 is prime. 7 will itself factor into some other number. So once we're done here, it will be all simplified. It's plus or minus the square root of 16, which is 4, times the square root of 7, which is square root of both sides, we divide both sides by 4. Just real quickly, I saw this on some papers and it's, and it's perfectly fine. It just maybe adds another step. Or if we just take the square root right away, not all problems are going to work out. <coughs> this one works out nicely because it is up to 4 here. If we took the square root of 4p squared, what would the square root of 4p squared be? 2p. Why is 2p the square root of 4p squared? But that divided by two by on both sides maybe is an extra step at the end we don't want to maybe we divide by four to start with. That would be my preference. I would definitely divide by four first. But you didn't. That's fine. The same answer. Ideas? Start? Andrew? Take the square root of both sides. Sounds nice. We're hoping that the square root of this thing is just this. Can we justify that? Why is the square root the square root of this? This. X plus one. Exactly. X plus one times X plus one is the definition of X plus one squared. Okay, so the square root of that is x plus 1, the square root of this plus the square root of 64. At this stage, we want to know like, what this quantity would have to be 
equal to, and he relents quantity involves this mysterious x. We don't know about it, right? We don't know anything about it other than it's part of this expression that needs to multiply by itself to get 64. But that expression could be either positive or negative eight. Either one would work. We found a value of x that caused the, this guy right here to be a positive eight, we get 64. We found a value of x that causes this to be a negative eight, we also get 64, we get the square root. So when we're solving an equation, we take the square root at the state, we take the square root. We always are gonna say plus or minus the square root, whatever the square root is. Now keep in mind, this represents two things, really two equations. What's one equation that can represent? Plus one, Yes, and the other, where it equals negative. You don't have to write both of those every time. But you do need to keep in mind, you should get two solutions. When you, when you do this next part, when you subtract one, you should do it in two ways. Subtract it from eight and subtract it from negative eight. Let's solve this equation, subtract one on both sides. Solve this equation, subtract one on both sides. So x could be what? Negative nine. X could be seven. Whether x is negative nine or x is seven, it satisfies that equation. If we have a thing squared, whether it's an x or a p or an r, you know, whatever letter takes square root, we get that, just that variable. Even for a quantity, a whole parenthesis squared, if we take the square root of that, we just, we must just get what's inside the parentheses because we're multiplying it by itself. And then we're saying, what thing times itself gives you that? Well, it's just, it's just kind of uh, obvious when you say it that way. Right? We're taking a quantity, multiply it by itself, and say, what, what's something times itself that gives us this thing times itself? We start to see square root and square are inverses. We can treat them as if they just cancel each other out. So I'm going to give you one last one before we're done today. That'll be 31. Divide by four, okay, like that. Okay. Divide by four, because we like taking the square root so much that if we could just set ourselves up to taking the square root, which is a fairly simple thing to do, we would like to do that. So we would like to isolate the square thing so that we can take the square root of that thing. So now that we've done that, we can take the square root of both sides. X minus one equals what? Square root two plus or minus square root two. X equals one plus or minus square root two. We add one to both sides. Add one to both sides. We'll be adding one to square root two and adding one to negative square root two. So is this pre-quiz? Is this something that we have to turn in, or is it just for our own? Oh. Just prepare for the quiz next time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So the homework.
I'll send in a reminder to remind people who, who uh, remind me to pass it out. So is the homework 4.5 problems prepared for the quiz or?